So those are the four time frames, the four estates that we see an estate for years, an estate for period to period, an estate at will, and an estate at sufferance. Those are the time frames that define this leasehold estate. And while the tenant is under a valid lease, they have these rights that you have conveyed to them. And at the end of that lease, they will revert back to us in that reversionary right. Now, over on page 331, they talk about the validity of a lease. Remember, a lease is a contract. And because it is a contract, both parties still have to be able to satisfy the requirements of a contract. And they call it the capacity to contract. A person has to have the capacity, meaning legal age, sufficient mental capacity, all right? We had a property management company and there was a family in Shelbyville that the father got a job in Westfield and was going to move and his twin 17 year old daughters wanted to graduate from Shelbyville High. So they literally left their kids in Shelbyville. He moved, it was just a father and two daughters. He moved, he rented an apartment from us and let his two daughters stay in Shelbyville to graduate high school. The problem was they were 17. They did not have the capacity to enter into a contract or a lease. So we actually had to have the father sign the lease and make him responsible because he was of majority age where the two daughters were not, all right? Obviously, leasing has to be for the legal objective. It has to be an offer and can, uh, acceptance once again. And now here's this word again, it has to have consideration. Consideration is something of value. And when we talked about the freehold estate and we transferred those rights permanently, the consideration was money. Well, now that definition of consideration broadens a little bit. Because of the reversionary interest, I'm maintaining an interest in the property, even though I'm the landlord because eventually that property is gonna come back to me. So now something of value actually can be different. Like the tenant may repair the property. That may consider as value. I'll let you live in the house for three months. You fix the roof for free. And then when the house comes back to me under the reversionary interest, I now have a better house and I traded three months of rent for a new roof. So consideration here can mean something other than money because of the fact I maintain that interest in the property to come back to me. Darren, the headlight looks. We had a maintenance guy, I told you we had a property management company who actually lived in Shelbyville and he kind of kept an eye on the two daughters. But we used to trade out some of his pay for discounted rent because that had value to us as being our maintenance man on all the other properties. We discounted his rent and said, hey, we'll pay you X plus rent. So the, the value was he was maintaining other properties so that value could be offset in the money of rent because the properties were coming back. Um, in the old days, I'm not sure if they can still do this. In the old days, policemen used to live in apartment complexes and they would be like the apartment complex security and they would get discounted rent for living in that apartment complex 
to be the security for that apartment, all right? I'm not sure if they still do that. So those are all the things that a contract has to have. Now, there are items there on page 331 that we're gonna start talking about. Possession, that's obviously one of the things that we give the tenant. We give them possession so that the tenant can live in the property. On the top of the next page, they talk about the use. This is the lease where we define the use. I actually started, when I started managing property, my lease was like four pages long. Now it's like seven. Because every time somebody does something stupid, you got to end up putting it in the lease. All right. What would you think that you would use a house for? You would think you would live in it, right? We failed to have that in our lease and our lease also specified no animals. So we had a client at 38th and, geez, where is it? 38th and Shadeland, 38th, and, yeah, 38th and Emerson. She said, hey, no problem, no dogs. We go over to collect rent. Not only does she have a dog, she is running a grooming business out of the garage for dogs. And we had to say, dude, you can't do that. And she's like, well, it doesn't say I can't. It does now, all right? So we had to put in our lease only used for residential property. We didn't say don't park in the lawn until I went to one of my rentals. And during the spring when this ground was all wet, they had parked in the lawn and caused my lawn to look like ruts. That's horrible. I had to get a company in and roll the land flat again and all that. Then we put in our lease, don't park in the lawn, only park in the driveway or the streets, all right? So you start adding stuff as you go through because you're like, never would have thought of that. So you describe all of the uses, Shauna. So in the midst of your provisions that you see this, do you can you make those necessary changes while that uh, tenant is within their lease or do you need to wait until their lease has been terminated? Typically, you need to wait until that lease has been terminated because once you sign a contract, remember, I can't change the contract on you without your permission. Now, I theoretically could come to you and go, hey, Sean, I want to add a clause that says only for residential, Will you sign this amendment? We're going to novate the contract that you and I have. Will you sign this amendment saying that it's now only used for residential? If you say, yes, I will, then yes, I can change it. Remember, we can do anything we want as long as both parties agree. Okay. Now, typically, if you're the one doing the offense, you're probably going to go, well, no, I, I still want to park in the lawn. We've got five cars. I don't want my car in the street, it can get hit, which I kind of understand that. So I don't want to amend the lease. Okay, thank you. Then when the lease comes for renewal, you can put it in there, or when that tenant moves out, you put it in the next one. So say, but you know, literally time, you can't. I'm do sorry. I? Okay, so my lease ends, I mean, at that time, then the uh, leasee can use their discretion to either want to renew or just not, just choose to terminate at that point so that they can renew the clause or the contract, I mean? If they renew the existing, let me start this by saying, I am not a practicing attorney, all right? So don't take this as legal fact. <clears throat> um, if you renew a lease that is in existence, it's my understanding, that that lease doesn't change, you're simply renewing it. If you rewrite a new lease and I have you sign a new lease, that new lease could have new contract clauses within it that you either have to agree to or do not agree to, all right? Now, landlords probably try to take advantage of tenants un- I'm going to use the word ignorance. 
ignorance doesn't mean stupidity. Stupidity means someone is stupid, has low mental capacity. Ignorance just means they haven't learned, all right? And tenants tend to be ignorant. They have not learned the rules. Some of them have a really well, some have not. So if they come to you and go, hey, I wanna rewrite a new lease and it's just a renewal, they may put a new clause in and try and slide it by. If the tenant signs it, they should have read the lease, all right? The term of the lease is stated inside of the um, lease itself. And that is where you would put the defined end or if it's a period to period, that's where you would put that clause in there. Now the next word is called security deposit. Security deposit is money the tenant places to the landlord to prevent or protect the landlord from being harmed, financially harmed, all right? When the tenant moves out, if the property is in substantially the same condition, less normal wear and tear, the tenant would get their security deposit back. If the landlord feels he is harmed in the form of, you damaged my property and I have to repair it, or you moved out owing me a month's rent, that is still called harm. I'm still financially harmed. I might have a case to claim your security deposit to become my money. So security deposit is deposited by the tenant held by the landlord to protect the landlord from any kind of financial harm, which could include physical damage to the property and or lost rent if the tenant vacated early. Now here's the cool thing about security deposit. It is unlike earnest money in respect to this. Security deposits can be commingled inside of my personal bank account. Not a wise business decision, but certainly doesn't violate any administrative rules like the earnest money account does. So understand those are two different forms of money. Earnest money remains a client's credit and must be kept in a separate bank account segregated from my personal account. Earnest uh, security deposit is not required to be segregated. I can take your earnest, uh, your, I keep doing it, I'm sorry. I can take your security deposit today and go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse tonight by putting it in my bank account and using it. It's not a wise business decision because I still am liable for returning it to you should you move out under the conditions you're supposed to with no damage, but it is not a requirement, all right? 